Okay, today we're going to talk about using a scientific approach. And this presentation corresponds with Chapter 1, Section 2, which, is, which are pages 7 to 11 in your textbook. All of you by now should be somewhat familiar with the scientific method from your previous courses. Uh, but a, the generally accepted techniques that are collectively known as a scientific method can be seen here on your screen. And it involves several steps, including identifying a problem or posing a question, formulating a hypothesis or an educated guess, conducting experiments or tests that will provide the basis to solve the problem or answer the question, and then finally observing the results and drawing conclusions from those observations. Uh, we'll be working throughout the year to design our own um, experiments and scientific inquiries, and we're really going to try to make sure that we're using acceptable experimental techniques, and we really want to focus on sort of analyzing the experimental process. Uh, do we make any mistakes that we can find that may have skewed the data? So as we discussed in class, science is really the study of everything and the attempt to figure out how things work. And so that means that questions are driving scientific inquiry. These questions might come from an observation of a phenomenon. It could be perhaps that we're seeking a better solution to a pre-existing idea. Uh, but however they emerge, they certainly will evolve and sort of be transformed into the hypothesis. The hypothesis is the proposed answer to the question. And we're going to use this if-then-because format when writing hypotheses. So if this happens to the independent variable, then this will happen to the dependent variable because. We're going to make sure that we stick to that format throughout the year. Now, I've just used two terms that I hope you're familiar with. The independent variable is the variable that you'll be manipulating. Remember it this way. The independent variable is the variable that I change. The dependent variable is a response to that changing independent variable. And so it's very important that you only have one independent variable per experiment, because if you had two, you wouldn't be able to definitively say if the outcome was caused by the first or the second independent variable. So all of the other variables that are in the experiment, and we'll go over an example of this in class, um, they're going to stay the same, and we're going to call those control variables. And if we do that and manipulate only one variable at a time, then we have what is called a controlled experiment. So here's a sample observation to use, and we'll actually write a hypothesis from this. So you observe as you're walking home and it starts to rain that you're getting wet, and you start to question, will I be drier if I run home rather than walk home? Now, with that in mind, go ahead and write a hypothesis using the correct if-then-because format. And also, please identify the independent and dependent variable. You can pause this video and take a second to do that now. And so here's the sample hypothesis that I made. I said, if I run home, then I will stay drier because I will be in the rain for a shorter period of time. And from that, you can take the if section of that statement and that becomes your independent variable the if would be the, uh, the independent variable excuse me would be my speed am i running or am i walking and the dependent variable will be just how wet i actually am when i get home and just one last time the independent variable is the variable that you'll be changing that you'll be manipulating and the dependent variable will be a response to that changing independent variable once again, control variables are variables that will not change. In fact, they're going to be a constant. So in our example of running home in the rain, we would want to make sure that in doing the test that we wore the exact same clothes. If I wore a sweatshirt in the rain and another person were doing this test with me and wore a raincoat, then I would guess that my sweatshirt would absorb a whole lot more water than the raincoat. And so we wouldn't really be able to say one way or the other if the amount of time I spent in the rain made me wetter than the other person because the clothing could have been a factor as well. Okay, let's briefly compare and contrast scientific laws and theories. You can see on the right side of the screen that scientific laws describe an observed pattern in nature without attempting to explain it. An example might be Newton's first law of motion. Now, the explanation will come from the theory. On the left-hand side of the screen, you can see that a theory is something, that, a hypothesis that's been supported in multiple experiments. Now, these theories are never actually proven true, but instead grow stronger if facts continue to support them, if uh, experiments continue to support them. And if they don't, then they can be revised or replaced altogether. We will be spending considerable time creating scientific models. Scientific models make it easier to understand things that might be too difficult to observe directly. So here's a model of our solar system. 
it's a drawing, um, it's a pretty basic model that you yourself may have actually made in the past. Um, models can also take the form of being mental models, it could be a physical 3D model, it could also be a mathematical model. Regardless of the nature of the model, this course puts a pretty strong emphasis on model making and using models to help answer questions. So if you're modeling a system, you're, you're modeling a portion of the universe that's separate from the entire universe. And this system can have forces that are acting upon it and matter and energy that flow in and out of it. In the last slide, we looked at the solar system as an example. Here are two other examples, obviously an elephant on the left and a galaxy on the right. Okay, we're going to use this system model of a frog here to see how a frog eats, but also to understand the various characteristics of models. Uh, first of all, you have your boundary, which is the sort of edge of the model, where, where our system actually ends. Uh, we then have the components or the parts of the, uh, of the model itself that are labeled. You also have resources. It could be matter and energy that's moving into. Uh, in fact, also could be flowing through, as you see there with the flow, uh, through that model and out of the model at some point. And finally, you have this idea of feedback. Um, basically, systems in general and most things seek stability, and at times they can, they can be destabilized. And so negative feedback would help to in fact, stabilize a system. So to give you an example, if you think about your thermostat at home, if you set the thermostat to 72 degrees, and then you wake up one morning and it's really chilly outside, and the temperature falls down to, say, 68 degrees or so, then your furnace is going to kick on to heat up your house and restabilize that, uh, that thermostat to 72 degrees. Positive feedback can, in fact, destabilize a system. So as you can see here, if the birth rate increases, then the population increases overall, which can in turn lead to more births and an increased birth rate. So that, again, that system would be moving further away from its previous stable state. One other example of negative feedback, uh, if any of you happen to live near a small pond, um, you know it was quite dry this summer, and perhaps the level of that pond, water level, began to drop. Well, when that happens, there's less surface area exposed to direct sunlight, and therefore evaporation slows. So this example of negative feedback will, will help prevent the, the over-evaporation of water. And just to reiterate, all things in nature seek stability. And stability denotes a condition in which some aspects of a system are unchanging, at least at the scale of observation. So that could be static equilibrium, as in not moving. The ladder that's leaning up against the wall is balanced and therefore stable. Or it could be more of a dynamic equilibrium with steady inflows and outflows. Changing conditions is a sort of constant. We're going to have time in class to actually play around with this greenhouse gas simulator. It's a model, a computer model. Um, I'll put a link next to this assignment on our website, though, as well, so you can check it out at home. Uh, but we're going to use it to study sort of the effects of greenhouse gases, but also to look at a model and how uh, negative and positive feedback might be seen in this particular model. And I'd just like to reiterate one more time that there's a lot of emphasis on creating models and using models in this course. And so on an assessment, you might get a page like this, which asks you to, in fact, create a model uh, describing a phenomenon. All right, I hope that was helpful. If you have any questions, please send me an email or ask them in class. Take care.